Um, so tonight we've got um, Brother Harun Mogul. Uh, Brother Harun Mogul is executive director of the Maven Institute, which empowers American corporations and institutions with the knowledge of Islam and awareness of Muslims to enter new markets and connect to global audiences. Brother Mogul holds an MA in Middle East and South Asian Studies from Columbia University, where he is currently a PhD candidate. His fields of study include Muslim nationalism in South Asia, colonial and post-colonial Islamic politics, and the development of the Indian Ocean economy. Brother Mogul graduated from NYU in 2002 with a BA in Middle Eastern Studies and Philosophy and a minor in Arabic. He has also studied Persian, Punjabi, Hindi, and Urdu. Additionally, his academic engagements include Columbia, UPenn, University of Michigan, Cal Berkeley, and the University of Minnesota. Brother Mogul has been interviewed by, or otherwise featured on, CNN, NPR, The History Channel, and Time, among many others. Formerly contributing editor and NPH columnist for Islamica magazine, Brother Mogul maintains a popular award-winning blog, Avari. His essays and articles have been published in a variety of international and American media. He prepares policy reports and analyses for Thabba Foundation, an Abu Dhabi-based think tank, devoted to bridging Muslim tradition and contemporary Western politics and thought. His first novel, The Order of Light, was released by Penguin Global in 2006. Brother Mogul has been selected as one of over 500 global Muslim leaders of tomorrow, and will, he will be presenting his research into the efforts of new media at the Parliament of World Religion in Melbourne, Australia. So please join me in welcoming Brother Mogul. Uh, what I'm going to try to do in today's talk, uh, which is why Islamophobia is and isn't racism, is have a conversation about why I think Islam is the world's most misunderstood religion. What that's going to mean is talking about the way in which Islam is portrayed in the media, why there is such a confusion about Muslims and Islam in the media, and towards the end I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, people in different communities who are pushing for social justice, American Muslims, uh, people who are simply concerned about the kind of rhetoric or language that's being used, can push back more effectively. And tomorrow we're going to do a workshop which is going to deal with uh, more refined and, and targeted ways to look at Islamophobia and respond to it and become better communicators. Uh, so this is part of a larger series, so hopefully if you're here tonight, I would hope that you can also join us tomorrow for the workshop. With that, I'm going to start with a picture. Actually, I'm not going to start with a picture, I'm going to start with a quote. Um, this is a long quote, it's too long for a slide, so I will read it out. This is from the New York Times, June 10th, 2010, so this past summer. If you missed what happened this summer, uh, good for you. Muslim groups have encountered unexpectedly intense opposition to their plans for opening mosques. The objections have focused overwhelmingly on fear of terrorism, distrust of Islam, and a linkage of the two in opponents' minds. Wouldn't you agree that every terrorist, past and present, has come out of a mosque? Asked one woman who stood up Wednesday night during a civic association meeting on Staten Island. In the Q&A portion, I will tell you all sorts of really cool stories about what happened in New York City this summer, uh, but that means you have to stay for Q&A. Uh, but I'll tell you all sorts of intriguing and fascinating things, uh, what you didn't hear in the media, about how the Ground Zero Mosque controversy developed, and interesting ways in which it built support, and even in some cases found allies, uh, at times because of the tactics or language of people who were actively trying to oppose it. But I want you to remember this, this question. Wouldn't you agree that every terrorist, past and present, has come out of a mosque? Uh, I want you to keep that in your mind as we go on uh, through the rest of the thing. And then I'm going to show you the picture. A couple of you have been here before, so you're going to be bored out of your mind because it's like the exact same lecture. Um, but I appreciate your, I'm not looking at you, but I appreciate your dedication to me uh, or your desire for free food. Uh, and maybe it's just a free food and then it's awkward to eat and leave, so you know, this is the price you pay for your food. The question you have to ask yourself, is two hours of your life worth the cost of the meal you had? I'm serious, this is a really good strategy going forward in your life. Anything you do, figure out how much you could charge for your life per hour, and then weigh it against that. This is the picture I want to start with. What do you see in this picture? Anybody? Throw it out there. Wrestling match. Wrestling match. I, I, I didn't notice that. There you go. There's, there's a, what's up? Aggression. What else? Yes, this is the, these are pictures from the same New York Times article. Uh, and I think it's evocative of how a lot of these meetings went down and how a lot of Muslims in New York City and the United States and in the Western world in general felt uh, over the summer and over the last few years 
Uh, I also want to point out uh, how excellently the angry gentleman is dressed and that perhaps his poor choice of sneakers is itself an explanation for his anger and dissatisfaction with the world. Uh, but he does not look like a happy man, right? And it's also equal across gender boundaries because this woman is also not very happy. And I like this picture because if you ever notice, if you look at newspapers, whenever there is anything going on in the Muslim majority world, you'll always see the angriest person out of the whole protest. That'll be the picture. Just one dude who looks so angry, it doesn't even seem physically impossible to sustain that level of anger, yet somehow it was captured in that one picture. And in this case, it's kind of reversed. Uh, she's not happy. She's very angry. And this was basically a controversy that happened over a proposal to build a mosque in Staten Island, uh, led by the Muslim American Society, uh, where they were trying to buy uh, a, a former Catholic convent. So it was private property, it was a private sale, but it generated so much opposition and so much heat that in the end the Catholic Church withdrew the offer, uh, in part for the reason, I think, that there are a lot of Catholics on Staten Island, people in general weren't happy, and they probably had to weigh these considerations against each other. Here's what I want to say. The problem with the conversation around Islam in the West is that nobody knows what Islam is. Muslims included cannot figure out how they are supposed to explain Islam to people. Now partially that's because the Muslim community and Muslim history are so incredibly diverse that it's really hard to make that all make sense. How do you communicate all the ethnic diversity, racial diversity, religious experiences, history, all those different things in a way that you can package into a 10 second sound bite? It's kind of hard. The other problem is that most people have no idea what Islam is in this country because the Muslim community, which has been around for about six or seven decades, is really uh, less than 2% of the population, maybe 3% of the population. That means 96, 97, 98% of Americans don't have any direct exposure to Islam, and even if they know Muslims, uh, that doesn't itself mean that they understand anything about Islam. Uh, this is really the key problem that we face as a community, is we don't know how to tell people what we are. And one of the problems with the discourse around Islam, and I'm explaining this to you, is that Islam becomes a race, a religion, a fanatical political ideology, some sort of nationality, uh, some sort of cult, uh, and some sort of ethnic identity, oftentimes all at once. And so it leads to a conversation in which people who are promoting the interests of American Muslims, and people who are attacking the interests of American Muslims, are coming at it from different directions and are often talking past each other. I will explain that, so don't worry too much. Um, and I already said that, but it looks cooler if it comes up on a slide. Right? Weird is also such a weird word, isn't it? Like if you just isolate the word and look at it, it's just very strange. It's I before E, except after C, except for weird and foreign. Remember that. First thing I want to say is that in many ways Islamophobia is racism. Partially that's because Muslims are different colors that are not popular. Right? Um, even Muslims, when they meet white Muslims, get really excited because it's like, wow, you're so weird. Uh, where did you come from? Are you sure you're Muslim? And this leads to all sorts of fascinating situations. So uh, when I was growing up in Massachusetts in the 90s, a whole bunch of refugees from Kosovo came over and were settled in our community uh, where they were brought over with the help of some churches and the help of the local Muslim community. Now, people from Kosovo are Slavic, right? And they're actually, they're Indo-European. But the point is that they're from uh, Eastern Europe. They're white. They have blonde hair light eyes, light features, right? So I bring the littlest kid with me from one family that we were sponsoring. He's about six or seven years old. And he comes with me to the masjid for Juma, And he sits down next to me. And a really good friend of mine, African-American guy, big guy, he's really tall, comes and sits down next to me. So it's like me, little Kosovar kid, my friend, let's call him Ali. So we're sitting there. And the minute Ali sits down, this Kosovar kid looks at him and goes, <gasps> and I was like, oh man, this is not going to end well, right? Like, what, what is this kid's problem, right? And he turns to me and he says, there's black Muslims? And in my head, I was like, what? And he came from a place where every single Muslim had blonde hair and blue eyes. So he came from an environment in which he didn't know anything about Islam except for in his cultural context. This is a problem with a lot of immigrant heritage communities where they never interacted with Muslims from different parts of the world, different religious traditions. It gets mixed up together. But for the outside community, it means that a significant portion of the, the discourse around Islamophobia, it is racialized. And we can't shy away from that, even though it can be uncomfortable. And the perfect example of this is actually the way in which Barack Obama was attacked during the election campaign. 
if you remember early on in the election campaign, uh, Rush Limbaugh was going after the fact that we shouldn't elect someone who looks like him. But he changed the storyline when he realized, and this is something I've also heard Michael Bloomberg say, that for as many votes as Barack Obama would lose for who he was, he would gain an equal number, if not more. See what I'm saying? So he changed the tack, and he attacked him in a different way, and this is the interesting way. Do you remember this by any chance, this meeting? What was this all about? He's Arab. Actually, no, John McCain is not an Arab. So you're wrong. I'm kidding. Um, this is what this lady said. I can't trust Obama. I have read about him. I highly doubt she reads. Uh, and he's not, he's not, uh, he's an Arab. He's not, uh, which is what happens when you don't do your talking points before you speak. Uh, I can't trust Obama. I've read about him. And he's not, he's not, uh, he's, he's an Arab. Right? So all of a sudden the frame flips from African American to Arab because that can be more easily otherized. See what I'm saying? And the response that McCain gave is so famous for all the different things he didn't say, but especially the first word he said. Got that? No, ma'am, he's a decent family man. Because Arabs and families do not go together. Even though the other myth about Muslims is that we all have 275 children. Um, we don't, we have 250, so I'm setting the record straight. Now, if anyone did, that would be really freaky. This is a problem. And I want to tell you where this narrative came from. It came from the Iraq War. I bought a copy of The Economist today to read an article I wanted to read. And there's a great little paragraph in there about whether or not the West should intervene in Libya. And The Economist says, uh, you know, the last time we went to an Arab country as liberators, it turned awkward. We didn't go to Iraq as liberators. Like, nobody remembers this. We went there because we were told that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And I want to go back to this. This is a very important point. Now, after September 11th, there was a lot of confusion in the United States over what had happened. There was a lot of anger, but there was a lot of confusion. And President Bush made the point, he said in a mosque only several days after the attack, that Islam is a religion of peace. Now, when he did that, because he was on the right, it was very hard for people on the right to disagree with him because he was the president. So the Islamophobic discourse that exists now was suppressed. It's not that it wasn't there, but it wasn't public, and it wasn't as prominent. Now, when President Bush said this, he focused on the Taliban in Afghanistan, right? When the decision came up to go after Iraq, it forced us into a conversation where we had to link Iraq to Afghanistan as part of a larger threat. And the minute that happened, it created a narrative that went beyond Al-Qaeda and, and, and bin Laden and that group to a larger narrative about a general threat from the entire Muslim world that was much bigger than anything the Taliban were capable of. And when that came up, it meant that Muslims in general became far more problematic. Do you see what I'm saying? And this is where every sort of ethnic affiliation associated with Muslims became even more problematic. Hence, Limbaugh frames Obama as an Arab, because being an Arab is a bad thing. It means you are the opposite of a family man. Um, I guess because Obama's a man, so we don't have to worry about the gender confusion.